I could hear screaming, I could hear the sounds of licks, but I couldn't actually see the beatings. This week on the show, March 8th is International Women's Day. Like May Day, it's a holiday founded by radicals in the U.S., but now more widely observed around the world. There, colonialism, capitalism, and war are still feminist issues. Are they here? We talk with Monique Wilson and Agnes Pereo, two leaders of the One Billion Rising mobilization. And later, an excerpt from a new film on the heroic women of the U.S. civil rights movement. All that and a few words from me on Hillary Clinton. Welcome to our show. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. On February 14th, 2013 and 14, millions of people took to the streets around the world to stop violence against women and girls, and they made a call for justice. In 2015, One Billion Rising, spearheaded by the anti-violence movement V-Day, is going one step further and demanding transformation. This year's action was called One Billion Rising Revolution. What's been learned? What's been achieved? The Risings have brought together some amazing women with a lot of stories to tell. And we have two of them right here today. Agnes Pareo was named the United Nations in Kenya Person of the Year in 2005. She's the founder and director of two V-Day safe houses for girls in Kenya, established for young women and girls fleeing female genital mutilation and early marriage. She's also been a candidate for Kenyan Parliament. Also with us, Monique Wilson. She's an actress. She was a star for three years. She played the lead in the hit musical Miss Saigon in London. Now she's the director of international affairs of the Gabriella Party, a national alliance of grassroots women's groups in the Philippines. And she's also director of the One Billion Rising campaign. Monique, Agnes, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. We're Thank glad you. to be here. When you walked in, Monique, you said the revolution is happening. What do you mean? <laughs> it's definitely happening. You know, as you mentioned earlier, One Billion Rising in the first year was a call to end violence against women and girls. Because, you know, for 15, 20 years, we'd wanted to escalate our actions because, you know, many things have happened, but we know that the violence is still very much in place and impunity is still ongoing. So the second year, our justice call really saw the intersectional issues really come out in the discourse. You couldn't anymore say you want to end violence un unless you looked at poverty, at policies, at race and gender. So when we gathered all our global coordinators for Women Rising in Rome, they really wanted another escalation. And we're like, how are you going to escalate a justice call? So it was really a natural course of action to say revolution, because when you say revolution, it's really a, a radical shift in consciousness and concrete change. So when you say it's happening, what are you seeing around the world? Well, we've got nearly 200 countries again signing up for One Billion Rising, putting on events, thousands and thousands of groups all around the world, and, and really coming up with radical, audacious, militant, artistic actions to bring the issue of violence against women again at the forefront and at the center. And also now the insistence, it's not just awareness racing anymore. And sometimes it's not even justice, because what we learned from last year is that there are so many social injustice issues that actually you can't find justice for those things in courts. Mm. So really what you need to change are systems. Mm. And not just systems, but mindsets so also. So how do you s change systems with a, a day rising? It isn't a day now. <laughs> it definitely is no longer just a day. Feb 14 is a symbolic day, but as we saw this year, we have risings all the way, even from September of the year before, all the way to January. March 8th is a big day. In fact, a lot of the risings then really sort of catapult into March 8th, but then you have May 1st, Workers Day, all the way to November 25, mm -hmm. International Day to Eliminate Violence Against Women. So I think what we've seen is that everyone has used it locally mm -hmm. in all communities around the world as a platform to keep their issues visible, mm -hmm. but also to keep their demands escalated. What's it been looking like in Kenya, Agnes? What are the risings that you've been part of look like? What have you done? Uh, well, uh, uh, we have been addressing female genital mutilation and early marriage. And we started back in year 2000, and it has been going on. So when you talk of uh, one billion rising, it's just to mark what has been happening every day. So what is happening every day? Uh, there are activities happening for the FGM, awareness, 
rescuing their girls and the alternate rights of passage, there is a lot so in res education. Rescuing girls, alternative rights of passage, education. I need you to back up just a little. We talk about FGM, and it's not a euphemism, but it does kind of obscure what we're talking about. Female gentle mutilation happened to you. You've told your story. What is still happening to the girls that you're working with? Uh, the, you see, female genital mutilation is a culture, and it is among the people, among the community, and they believe it and they, they value it. So what we have been doing is trying to raise awareness on what female genital mutilation is and the effects of female genital mutilation and the need for girls not to go through female genital mutilation and rather have education and which we believe that education is power and after they have known and learned what they they want they can be able to make informed decisions how did you become an activist you were 14 when you went through this yeah when i went through fgm i didn't want to go through it because i had friends in school who insisted that i should not go through it so when i went back there was a lot of pressure on me and my father supported me but my mother insisted that she should not be in one house with a woman who have not been cut because she will not know what to call me whether to call me a baby girl or to call me a woman and she appreciated calling me a woman because i'll be accepted in the community and i can go through all the uh, rituals mm. that are there how did your work agnes intersect with eve and, and eve's v-day campaign we met with the eve when i was in the field I was trying to create awareness to a group of teachers. So she came to me and I had a, a, wooden, a wooden model that showed all the parts of a vagina. And she was impressed with what I was doing. So you were tra walking around and you were walking, walking carrying around. this wooden model yes, of a vagina. I had my wooden model with me because I thought I was talking to the people who have not gone to school. And the only way they could remember the messages that I was trying to pass to them is by them seeing. Mm. So my wooden model is still there, and it is a, a tool that I use. And when Eve came in, came, Eve came in and assisted us to drive our dreams and by giving us tools and facilitating us to do our work better than we used to do. Like what? She asked you, what did you need? Uh, the first day she told me, Agnes, what, did you, what do you want me to do? What can I do to help? I said I needed a vehicle. And then I got a jeep. And that jeep have helped me to reach more women than I, than I used to reach when I was walking. Mm. And then again, it, it, I was feeling safe because I could not go sleeping in people's houses because I could drive myself to the field and come back home. And what are the numbers with respect to female genital mutilation now? How has it changed since the days when you were 14? There is a dramatic change because no longer we could hear girls going through the cut and there, were, there are no longer celebrations because cutting a girl was a big day, celebrated, people feasted, feasting, drinking, eating, and these days is not happening. Mm. Even the number of girls we receive at the, at the safe house has gone down. I think I saw a statistic somewhere on the One Billion Rising website that in 75, 1975, 98% of women, and now yes. it's something like 27%. 27%. Wow. Still 27% too many. Yes, it's still there. Because it's a culture, you cannot say that it can die in a, in a day. Because it, there are reasons why it keeps coming back. One is because of poverty, and the other one is because of lack of education. That's why we are trying to put more efforts in education. Well, we have a lot of culture change we need all around the world. And I want to ask you about some of the others um, that the OBR movement has been addressing. One of them is this culture of impunity when it comes to those who are using and perpetuating violence. And then there are some others I want to get to. But Monique, how are people taking on the question of impunity? And let's include the opposite, um, specious imprisonment, incarceration of women who have not committed violent crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what One Billion Rising helped do is to bring really like massive discourse into what are what is causing and perpetuating the violence. Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen is that we have raised awareness, women are also empowered now to talk, 
But the impunity that's in place is most of the time state instigated, instigated by policies, instigated by our cultures. So I think when you look at someone like Agnes, she's really been revolutionary from the start because you're really questioning such an entrenched belief yeah. that is, you know, in the beginning unpopular to do in a community. And yet you know, she's brave enough and visionary enough to, to know what that change could mean for the girls. And I think that was a long time ago, but now I think we've seen activists all over the world find that kind of bravery to tackle impunity because it's not enough to actually just say we want to end violence without going into the what is causing it. And that is always the scarier part because you have to call out your perpetrators. You have to call out your state, your government, uh, maybe your departments of education, maybe your parents, maybe your lovers, maybe your husbands. So it, it's, it's very much like um, a breaking open of the silence as well. And in the Philippines, Gabriella has been part of calling out the United States and the history of imperialism. I mean, Gabriella is, is a staunchly militant anti-imperialist uh, movement because what we recognize is that we are enslaved and entrenched in, um, in subservience to the West and our policies are very much tied to the US because our government has no political will of its own and they are economically um, dependent on the US, so we've, they've made themselves to be. So which means that our sovereignty is removed from us. And when that happens, you are economically deprived of everything. So in the Philippines, for example, our revolution call has been to not just end impunity and end violence, but to end poverty. But you can't say just end poverty, that's so broad and generalized. How do you end poverty? Well, you have to call out all the corp foreign corporations who are pillaging our land. You have to call out um, uh, the visiting forces agreement that we've just signed with the U.S. that are militarizing all our our countrysides that are, you know, that are causing a lot of violence to our women. You have to call out our economic dependence, but you have to call out also in your own government that is allowing that to happen. So in fact, in the Philippines, our, our call was system change. Now it's, I think we're going to oust our president. <laughs> you have, you know, you just have to go all the way. I think, you know what I've learned with the revolution call? Because I kind of experienced this in other sectors. Well, you can call for revolution, but you have to toe the line. We're like, that, that is a contradiction. <laughs> Toe the line means like behave and keep quiet. I think we've been quiet for a long time. So I think, I think what revolution at least means to me and to many activists around the world is how far is your brave? How far do you go with your courage? I mean, look, Agnes has been a shining example for all of us. She went against so many things. And look at where her work has brought her, a really transformative radical change and we see it. Now, One Billion Rising is an interesting mobilization and you call it an, a mobilization because it's not so much an organization as it is a network of people I've learned over the years. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make? I mean, in a situation like the Philippines, Gabriella is very strong, very active on the streets. What difference does it make to have you also be related to One Billion Rising? I'm thinking we talked once about the protest that took place after it looked as if there was going to be no prosecution of a Marine who was accused of um, rape of a uh, trans mm -hmm. uh, alleged sex worker. Woman, yeah, you know, you know, you know, in in the, you know, what One Billion Rising gives to us, and I'll just speak from the Philippine point of view. And we have a dynamic women's movement, a radical, militant, um, very proactive movement for 30 years now. Right. But something like One Billion Rising, again, just to make it clear, there's nothing of One Billion Rising that dictates to us. You cannot dictate to militant activists what to do and how to do it. We know what we want. We know what we need on the ground. But something like One Billion Rising gives us an energy. The energy is artistic and creative because it's art and activism, which I know as an artist, also my other life, is, is it's very powerful to use an artistic form to create awareness, to create consciousness, to deepen consciousness. But other than that, it also ties you to a global solidarity movement, which is very, very important because then you don't feel like you're in just in your struggle by yourself. You are in connection with amazing women all around the world, which you draw strength from, and also wisdom and experience. And also that even things like our local governments and media recognize that you are part of a big global movement, so they give you the attention. And that's what One Billion Rising has given us. It's given us energy. It, it, it's like a catalyst. You know, all of a sudden, it's creative protest. And that is very disarming to some, you know, to some of our perpetrators because they're like, 
they're used to us just protesting and shouting on the streets. But when you start dancing, it's really powerful because it's collective. And when you start being creative, all the women who are dancing are equally empowered. And it's international. Yes. People know at the local level that you have their back internationally. And, and also I think what one, as a, as a global director, it also gave me a perspective that our issues all of a sudden became visible to each other internationally, which is really, I think, an important, you know, like all of a sudden we got to know the, the issues of, let's say, Mali, Botswana, Myanmar, as our issues in the Philippines became known to other countries. And I think that openness well, is a way forward. If we had a media that worked, um, we wouldn't need you to tell stories one to one, but we need you. So, so Agnes, for those of us who don't know the issues that um, you're facing, frankly, the entire continent of Africa is poorly covered in our country. Mm -hmm. If you were to lift up maybe two examples of the sorts of struggles people should know about that you're fighting, what would they be? Uh, one thing, the one billion rising, to go back to it, have really helped us connect with the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we used to work as small uh, grassroots women movements that are down there and nobody cares about them. <clears throat> but once we are connected with the, with the world, our governments will also start implementing the existing laws mm. that they have signed and are always shelved in their cupboards and nobody implements them. But once we are out and speaking out with strength and they see us on TVs, they see uh, that we have connection, they also start coming to us telling us, Agnes, what are you doing? Can we work together? Then the children's office is also there. So we connect all that movement of the, uh, the, uh, the arms of the government that are not working to start working. Because for a long time, women have been quiet. Nobody talks about what's happening. They think it is the culture to be the way they are. They think they are supposed to be where they are. But we, after we have talked and said no to FGM, no to violence, no to early marriages, women are now coming out and speaking on their own. I want to thank you both for coming, and Agnes Mooney, you. keep up your great work. Thank and we you. will put links to V-Day and One Million Rising at our website. Thanks. You see, these people come with guns to defend, to keep us down from this, registering the vote. This vote really must be about something. And I said, if I die, I die for something. The possibility of violence made it necessary to train civil rights workers. 14-year-old June Johnson convinced her mother that she would be well looked after on a training she went to in South Carolina. On June 9th of 1963, myself, Fannie Lou Hamer, Anel Ponder, Uvesta Simpson, several other SNCC workers was returning from Charleston, South Carolina after attending a nonviolent workshop. Normally the bus would come to the back entrance of this building. This particular bus stopped in the front of this facility. We got off the bus. This was a counter, lunch counter here. This area over here was played. There were tables and chairs, police officers and state troopers all over the place. There was a white waitress that came to the counter. She didn't wait on us. She asked us why were we here. We told her we'd like to be served. The police officers and the highway patrolmen came to the counter and said to us, niggas, get out of here. You are not allowed on this side. I got off the bus and asked them what had happened. They said the chief of police and a highway patrol had made them leave out. Do we want to go back into this place and be served and risk becoming arrested? Or do we want to get on the bus and go on to Greenwood? We all concluded that, you know, it was going to happen eventually. So let's go back inside of the place. We walked to the back of the highway patrolman car. And I was writing the state tag number down. They came out and said, what the hell are you doing to my car? And why are you taking the tag numbers down? And they placed us on the arrest. The one from the car that they was in screamed and said, get that one there. And it was the police then told me that I was under arrest. So as I stepped to go into the cell, the highway patrolman knocked me on the floor and just started beating me with a blackjack in their feet. I could hear one of the officers say, that's enough. 
take her back there and bring the next one out. They put me in the cell where a nail was, but they took her out and took her into the same area and beat her. I could hear screaming. I could hear the sounds of licks, but I couldn't actually see the beatings. And then not too long after then, I saw Miss Annie L. Ponder pass my cell. She was beat up very bad. And then three white men led me into another cell. And in that cell, they had two Negro prisoners. And then they made me lay down on my face. They forced them to beat me. I was taken by Stokely Carmichael over to see Fanny Lou Hamer. She had been beat in the Winona jail until she was hard. And she says, you can't have that kind of hate in you. Because I was very angry. She said, it will destroy you. So we're going to have to find a way to love them. We're going to register to vote. We're going to love them enough to get them out of these offices. And we're going to send them home. And she went on and had us laughing, you know, how we were just going to love them because they're sick and we need to get rid of them. And when she got through talking, you just wanted to go out and do something. You didn't want to go hurt white folks, which is a absolutely incredible uh, phenomenon when you realize how much she had been abused and how much pain she had endured. Uh, that was not her mission. That was not her mission. Her mission was to love yourself enough is to take this chance so that we can get this freedom that God has prepared for us and that these young people, and she always talked about the young people, that these young people are here to help us acquire. <sighs> well, I started feeling like I could do anything. Hillary Clinton effectively entered the 2016 presidential race this February with a major speech to a women's conference in Silicon Valley. Where it is, Clinton's decided to make gender even more central to campaign this time around. In California, she did just that. She also exposed the incredible whiteness of her feminism, which reminds a lot of us just why her campaign was so painful the last time. Just seconds after she was introduced, Clinton made very clear her vision of America, our country is a great entrepreneurial experiment, she began, founded by pioneers and new patriots like her ancestors. No acknowledgement there that by far the most successful early entrepreneurs were enslavers. Their capital captured people, their land seized from Native Americans. People of color don't tend to omit that part of the story of our country. The erasure is a familiar sign of whiteness. Clinton went on to bemoan the sexism of Silicon Valley, where only four of the top investors are female and 83% of tech jobs are held by men. But the same percentage of workers is white. Would a more gender equal whiteness be acceptable? Given the history of white people who've said yes to that, Clinton has a responsibility to be explicit. I'm not even going to get into Clinton's reference to former Secretary of State, my friend Madeleine Albright, who apparently once said that there's a special spot in hell reserved for women who don't help other women even as she endorsed sanctions that led to the deaths of tens of thousands of Iraqi women and children in the 90s. We have an uprising happening in this country, which we didn't have eight years ago, and thank heavens for it. It's led by women of color, many of them young, queer, and trans women who don't find it so hard to hold race and gender in their minds simultaneously. Theirs is a capacious vision of justice, with room enough for everyone. Does Hillary Clinton really think the women of mobilizations like Black Lives Matter and We Can't Wait aren't watching, listening, and hearing their exclusion? And does she really think she can get elected without them? As she herself said in Santa Rosa, inclusivity is more than a buzzword. It's a recipe for success. For Barack Obama, that was literally true. He lost the white women's vote, but women of color gave him the edge to get elected. But you know what? Inclusivity is not even really the point, nor is winning. What we need, and we need desperately, are leaders who are honest about right now existing privilege and power, how things got set up this way, and what we might conceivably do to redistribute things so as to give us all some chance of surviving and making it into a less divided, more beautiful 21st century. Tell me what you think. Write to laura at grittv.org. And thanks.
This week on the show, Ai Jen Pu, director of the Domestic Workers Alliance. How is it that after 75 years of exclusion, in 2015, when we need to be strengthening and growing this workforce, we're still fighting for these basic protections? Then a short film, No Sanctuary, looks at how the U.S. treats immigrant families by locking them up. These are prison companies, and their model and their experience is running prisons. Revolution. This March 8th for International Women's Day, the Laura Flanders Show brings you a global conversation about women's rights and making change. With women leaders from Afghanistan, Kenya, and the Philippines, joined by UCLA professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw and Tony Award winning playwright Eve Ensler. War, capitalism, and more. It's all part of the feminist agenda. Watch The State of Female Revolution, March 8th on KCET Link TV.